Today, I want to share with you some very interesting information. The trigger to share with you was the presentation of the Dean of the School of Nursing of Duke University to the North Carolina Legislative Committee, noted here, promoting a law to allow nurse practitioners to practice without supervision. He presented this information. States with unsupervised practice, which he calls full NP practice, have better health outcomes. So case closed, right? This proves that if you allow unsupervised practice, your state will experience better health outcomes. Well, let's look at some other information. This is an article that appeared in peer-reviewed literature showing that mid-levels in states without supervision overprescribed opioids 20 times more than physicians. And from publicly available data, we see that drug overdose deaths are very closely related to the increase of MPs in the United States. The correlation coefficient is 0 0.98. Seldom do you see such tight correlation between variables. This seems to be convincing information. I've shown you that mid-levels overprescribe opioids and that that leads to increase in overdose deaths. It's compelling data. But I am purposely lying to you to make a point. I'm confessing to you right now so that you won't think I really believe this. But could it could the increase in MPs be responsible for the increase in opioid deaths? I can't say that it's not so. It is possible. However, the important point is that there are many, many variables impacting the drug overdose rate, and I've shown you only one. Similarly, Ramos data about health outcomes, there are many factors which affect health outcomes. Unsupervised practice plausibly could be one of them, but only could be. The other hundreds are unexamined. And he is not pointing out this misleading information to you. Let's look at some other phenomena that are caused by the increase of MPs in the US. Here is one that has a very strong relationship. You can see that as the number of MPs go up, this other variable goes up very predictably. What is this variable? It's sea level. It has a very high correlation coefficient again. And yet another. Again, as in MPs increase, this other variable increases very predictably. What is this variable? It is death from strangulation by bed sheets. If we follow Ramos' fallacy, we might say that there is an epidemic of homicide by bed sheets committed by increasing numbers of MPs. Do you believe that? This is a very basic error in reasoning that was one of the many errors in statistical reasoning pointed out by this author in his famous book, first published in 1954, How to Lie with Statistics. The title was meant to be chung in cheek to get attention, but in our current case of Dr. Ramos' presentation, it is perhaps very literal. The general point is that correlation, a relationship, does not prove a causation. This was chapter eight in the book. He illustrates the concept with this following example. There are two clocks which keep perfect time. When clock A points to the hour, clock B strikes. Did clock A cause clock B to strike? Also, the author says this it is very concise and to the point, and I think it is well to read what he said directly. The fallacy is an ancient one that, however, has a powerful tendency to crop up in statistical material where it is disguised by a welter of impressive figures. It is one that says that if B follows A, then A has caused B. So this author in 1954 said it was an ancient fallacy. Dr. Ramos, as part of his coursework for his PhD, undoubtedly had to take statistics. And this was undoubtedly part of that course. Had he used this fallacy in his coursework, he would have been failed. It is certain that he knows of this, but he uses it anyway. 
the conclusion can only be that he is purposely misleading the legislators he was speaking to. How do you know when a speaker is trying to mislead you with this basic fallacy? First, any retrospective study has this as its fundamental flaw. Some retrospective studies can adequately control for the other hidden variables may also affect the result, but most do not. Then, the use of the phrases is related to or is associated with our tip-offs. For example, I've also already shown you here that MPs in the United States are associated with an increase in overdose deaths, also associated with a rise in sea levels, and associated with increasing deaths from bed sheets. These statements are true. They are associated. The association statement encourages you to immediately assume they are caused by these things. Do not assume that. Ramos' presentation is rife with this type of misleading statement. Here's the one we've already looked at, which invites you to assume that full practice laws cause better health outcomes. Here is another. Correlation of workforce growth with unsupervised practice. Right now, I will point out another flaw. We assume that the data he is showing us is actually correct, that he is correlating two things and that they are correct. In fact, there's another level of some misleading present here. The data he presents says that the numbers of MPs grew more in states with unsupervised practice. I've investigated this myself and found that this is manifestly untrue. The workforce grew faster in states with supervised practice. I'm not going to show this data here because it's not precisely the point of this presentation. It would take some time to do. I just want to point out that there can be and are several levels of misleading going on here. This data, again, in implies that full practice laws cause increase in the workforce. Then there is this. He says that unsupervised practice is associated with a higher supply of nurse practitioners in rural counties. Note the trigger word we've learned to look out for, associated with. Also note that this is one variable, unsupervised practice, compared to another variable, number of MPs per 100,000 patients in rural areas. There are innumerable other variables uncontrolled for. To name one, the number of MPs produced by schools in the states with unsupervised practice. Again, this implies full practice laws cause improvement in rural health care access. He also doesn't point out that the number of MPs produced everywhere in the U.S. is rising dramatically. Therefore, the number who happen to go to rural areas would increase as well. This is a rising tide lifts all ships situation. So let's look at the increase in the number of MPs throughout the U.S. You see that the number of MPs per 100,000 patients first is rising throughout the U.S. And second, that it is at all times higher than the number of MPs in rural areas. This means, of course, that most are going to non-rural areas, which directly refutes his contention. Now, as with the previous data, I will tell you that I have data that indicate that the number of MPs going to rural areas is not as he portrays it. But let's forget about that for now, and let's concentrate on his data presentation. So the number of MPs in the U.S. is going up everywhere in the U.S. Is the increase greatest, again, per his data, in unsupervised states or supervised states? Let's look at the increase in rural MPs in states with unrestricted practice, states with restricted practice, and all U.S. states. And let's compare the increase percentage-wise between 2009 and 2012, where we have the data. Here's the data. Which wins? The states with restricted practice 
increased 10% more than the states with unrestricted practice. And the states with restricted practice increased more than the average increase throughout the U.S. as shown by the increase in all U.S. states. Now, I don't know if this is statistically significant, and I wouldn't claim it to be. The point is the distortion of the data he is using. So the dean of the School of Nursing used this well-known statistical manipulation to mislead the legislators in North Carolina. I maintain that he knows about this statistical error, and he used it anyway to further his cause. <laughs>